episodes, Iowa has now, so far, they've swept the board with the kids that came on official visits on June 23rd. And I am, I say this all the time, I'm no by no means a recruiting expert, um, but the individuals that visited, everyone is committed but two, and, and they're both still on the board. Xavier Lucas, uh, another DB out of Fort Lauderdale, who's got a bunch of really good offers. Frankly, I could see him, again, not being a recruiting expert, but based on his offer list, I could easily see him getting a fourth star by the time he commits. I mean, he's got offers from literally like everyone, uh, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Iowa, Wisconsin, Alabama, uh, but he did visit. That would be a huge win for uh, for this staffer, Abdul Hodge and, and Phil Parker that were in on him. And then Chima Chiniki, I believe is how you, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, edge rusher from Plano uh, with another solid list of offers. A lot of Big Ten schools, Kansas, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech. He also visited both those guys undecided. So, boy, if you land those guys, that's one of the <laughs> – the greatest uh, weekends in recent history for Iowa football recruiting. Uh, as it relates to LeVar Wood, did you have something to add there, Mark? Now that you've stated all that, I do have a question for you. Sure. Because I do believe, as I've stated before, that the further you go down the re recruiting rankings, the less meaningful the ranking is. You know, being 28 versus being 42. Not that there's not separation there. Most likely but it's probably minimal and it may actually turn out that 28 should be 35 and 42 should be 32. Uh, I, I just think the separation is minuscule as you go down the rankings. So me looking at my team, I think it's much easier for me to evaluate a class because of the expectations. How are you and how have you in the past evaluated an Iowa recruiting class? Because I think for you, it goes well past this recruiting ranking um, and, and now you're looking at certain targets that you just mentioned and maybe an expectation of how many of those they get. So you're, you're asking me how I weigh rankings and what I'm seeing when I watch film of these guys, just, just basically how you evaluate. I was recruiting hall each year. What are those indicators for you to come on here or on your platform and say great recruiting class or solid recruiting class or Hey, down year i've said a, a number of times you know stars don't matter star ratings don't matter that's true and it's not true i think you and i both agree that the people who are ranking these kids have a better idea than you or me uh how these kids stack up with the rest of their class so i'm not for a second gonna act like the star ratings mean nothing however we looked at a stat last week about how iowa in the past what eight years eight draft classes They've drafted uh, six three-star or less players in the first round of the NFL draft. So I was thinking about that too, Mark, in, in the last few days because you and I had a really uh, in-depth conversation. And uh, I was a little bit adversarial last week toward you. A little bit adversarial. Uh, I don't know why I got, I got my feathers ruffled a little bit, Mark. Uh, and I'm not apologizing for getting my feathers ruffled. I'm not going to do that. Uh, if you asked me to, I would. But anyways, uh, the reason I bring this up is because you and I have two very, very polar opposite perspectives on a lot of things, including, I think, how you build a program. And I, I can see it from your perspective. And I think it's harder for you to see it through, from my perspective because Iowa is so abnormal. You know, and that's kind of as Iowa people, that's what we know. But like six guys in the past eight years that were three star or less recruits being drafted in the first round is so insane. It, you know, in comparative to the rest of the conference, I think Penn State had one. And, and I'm sure rest of the country. I, I didn't see how Iowa stacked up with the rest of the country with that stat, but comparative to the rest of the Big Ten, that's so abnormal. But it's typical. We we, we are used to being able to say, oh, star ratings don't matter because they develop guys. And that's credit to Phil Parker and the rest of the staff on defense and certain spots on offense, tight end, offensive line primarily, but that is not the norm typically. So I acknowledge that rankings do matter, and you're obviously going to be excited. when You can be on the radar for four- and five-star kids, and Iowa has struggled to develop at skill positions. And so being able to rely on rankings, not to say that Iowa is going to be strictly relying on rankings, but when you see Iowa in the running for a four- or five-star skill position player, that's going to get you even more excited. 
So first of all, I don't believe that we're polar opposite on much. That's that's a pretty extreme position. You're an Ohio State. You're an Ohio, you're a college football guy, but you literally follow a program that could not be more polar opposite than Iowa. Although Ohio State develops guys, you're going to be you're going to be the type of guy that falls back on recruiting is the most important part of college football, right? Is that fair to say? Absolutely. It's the most important part of college football, and I think you're probably right. I know that's such a generic statement to make, but I think you're probably right. But for Iowa fans of the last 20, you could argue 43 years, yeah, it matters, but not nearly to the extent that it matters almost everywhere else. So I I don't want to get to a point where semantics are ruling the day because we don't want to go there. They always so, do. So I, I, I want to make this meaningful. Like, like this is a meaningful difference. I, I get your point. I respect your points as always. I actually think Ohio State's more of an abnormality than Iowa. Okay. Be, because there's only two schools in the country that recruit with them. That's fair. But my point is the other school, there aren't many schools that can recruit at the low level that Iowa does according to the rankings and still compete at the level they recruit at. Usually you recruit at a level, that's where you compete. Like the Rutgers of the world are finishing lower tier of the Big Ten in recruiting and in results. The Ohio States and Michigans are recruiting at the high end of the Big Ten and they're finishing at the high end of the Big Ten. Like that's what I'm saying. It's I'm not saying everybody's getting five and four star recruits. I'm just saying usually you are what your recruiting ranking says you are. Yeah, I, I do think that there are other examples out there like sure. Iowa, Wisconsin, Kansas State, and a few others. Very true. Yes. And, and, and that stat of how many guys have been drafted in the first round is not all inclusive because Wisconsin is a developmental program. You think about what Michigan State was for years under Mike D'Antonio. Um, so, And actually, it was you who brought it up before I did that you were impressed with Ohio State's number considering they've signed the least number of three stars. I guarantee that it's not even close than the rest of the conference. Those numbers, those top two rankings, if anybody missed that, go back to our show last week when we discussed that, that stat, but the top two results are equally as impressive. Iowa with six. I'm not going to debate that. No, they're just for two totally different reasons. Yes, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) They're, they're both unbelievably impressive for two totally different reasons for two, totally different type of programs in eight years of the playoff era. And those eight drafts, I'm going to guess that Ohio state signed. They only had one last year. They only signed one three star. So they signed like two or three every year. And a lot like of that eight- era was under urban Meyer and they were, well, yeah. they've always recruited well. Right. But I don't think recruiting was any, how many three stars a year was urban signing? That's what I'm saying. They're they've they've been either number two to five every year. Yeah. So yeah, I I don't know exactly what those numbers are. I just went as soon as we both made that point. I was curious and went to last year, and they had won. So I'll I'll sum up what you asked me with this. With Iowa, there are positions, and and, and I view it kind of like tiers, right? Where rankings, you know. I'm going to raise an eyebrow to a star rating or ranking of a player more so based on their position. So DB and tight end, I I hate to say this. I almost don't care. I couldn't care less what, you know, what these guys rankings or ratings are because Iowa, I mean, look at TJ Hawkinson and Noah Fant. They they turned into two of the best tight ends in college football. They were both drafted in the first round. Neither one of those guys had a four or five star rating next to their name coming out of high school. I mean, TJ Hawkinson was from the community of Sheraton, Iowa. So George Kittle, same way, didn't end up in a first round draft pick. He may be the best tight end of the league right now. So like tight ends, not a position I worry about. DB is absolutely not a position I worry about. So those two positions, you're, you're just rock solid on. I am much more concerned with Iowa being able to compete at a higher level from a recruiting basis at wide receiver, which they're rarely able to do. And when they have, they've unfortunately lost some guys like Keegan Johnson, Arlen Bruce, et cetera. It's very rare that Iowa can find a Charlie Jones. Now he was a transfer, but he was a a no name transfer that Iowa brought in. That was a diamond in the rough, but it's so rare that you get one of those. And that Iowa is the team that the program that spots one of those. 
<laughs> so so that's that's where I would stack this up. And then there's other positions throughout. I mean, I have no doubt Iowa knows how to develop offensive linemen, but not to the level that I'm confident with DB and with tight end because they've struggled. I mean, they've recruited a number of linemen over the past four to five years, and we've discussed this, that have completely flopped. I, I don't need to name names, but they have not developed. Some guys are out of the program. The clock has ran out. The hourglass has ran out on these guys. So I think anybody, even though Kirk Ferentz is thought to be a, an O-line guru, there should be a bit of a damper in faith in his ability and the Iowa program's ability to evaluate talent or develop talent. And I think those two things go hand in hand because Iowa most more than likely when they're looking at a guy, they're looking at, is this a guy we can develop? Obviously they're not ready to take the step right now, but can we develop them in two to three years? That's, that's a science and Iowa has done well at times, but in the last few years, they've struggled at that position quarterback. They've always struggled developing. So yes, I mean, Quarterback is such a unique position, but I would say star ratings typically matter. I do think Marco Linez is underrated from a national standpoint. He had good offers, didn't have great offers. I know Minnesota offered him after he committed to Iowa, and he stuck loyal to his commitment, had Rutgers and a few others. But, uh, yeah, that's a it's not, recruiting is a science, and I, I, I do make that statement at times that rankings don't matter. They do and they don't, if that makes sense to me. And there are different uh, categories of science, of course. So Iowa has proven to be very adept at being, let's say, the chemist, but they are not the biologist because if if, if it was so that they would move their their scientific knowledge to the offense and address that, uh, but they've not been able to to, to do that. Yeah, um, and I think that's that's part of the we go full circle. That's a big part of the excitement around the Iowa program this year, is because they added people at positions where they've struggled to recruit and struggled to develop. And we're talking about Cade McNamara, who's by no means Robert Griffin III or Johnny Manziel, but he is a proven winner, a proven game manager, a solid, solid game manager quarterback who knows how to play the game of football at a high level, has done so, won championships. And then Caleb Brown, Ohio State product. Uh, Seth Anderson, not as proven but has has great bloodlines. But those two, I mean, it's Caleb Brown and Cade McNamara. This season, success of this offense are going to be hinging on those two pieces, along with the run game as a whole, as it always does at Iowa. If Iowa can't run the ball, it's going to be hard for anybody to function. But even if they do run the ball, they're going to be limited if they can't get better play other wide receivers. Uh, before we move on to LeVar Woods, uh, Ari says here, star rating is about potential. Absolutely. Yes, it is. It's all about potential. How fast can you run? How quick are you? How strong are you? How explosive are you? However, that usually shows up on the football field at the high school level as well, but not always. It doesn't mean that two wide receivers playing in the same conference in high school, one could have caught 100 passes and one caught 30, and the, the guy that caught 30 is a higher-rated player because he is athletically more gifted. But that giftedness usually shows itself. This comment, on the other hand, Aaron says, no star rating, uh, nah, star rating is about a player's ability to step in and play day one. So he's, so he's, he's saying argument. it's not. No, I, I think he's arguing with, with our other user, Ari Gold. Because Ari oh, Gold's okay. star rating so, is about potential. Okay, I misread this initially. So I, I agree with this as well. I do too. You, yeah. you, could, you could draw a direct line. Not every year, every team, but 90% of the time, if you took any team and you went from their top rated player to their last and you looked at their freshman playing time, you'd see a correlation. Absolutely. And you know what I've done? I've only been running this channel for a few years and I just never really followed recruiting that, that closely before. And I still don't follow it to the extent that a lot of these people do out there, but like you asked me how I look at recruiting classes every year. I've noticed that I've got a couple of guys that I'm like, okay, this is the guy to watch for. And I just, even regardless of rating like this year in 2023, well, 2020, I'll give you a better example. 2022. I remember saying, and this is easy for me to say this now it's convenient, but I did say it. We can go back and 
listen, I said that the, my biggest dark horse from that class was a guy named Addison Estringa, who was a 1,000 plus ranked player out of what what little town in Wisconsin. But he's a tight end, and he played as a true freshman, and is probably going to be really good. Now he might not play a whole lot this year because they brought in Eric All for one more year, but he's got a chance to be really good. And obviously, Iowa saw that in him. When I watched him on tape, I thought, man, this kid is way, way – he just looks better than he's ranked. Um, they're just guys that pop off the 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 uh, screen. Even when you're just looking at highlight film, you cannot judge a kid <laughs> based solely on five minutes of highlight clips. But he's a guy that I remember saying, man, this guy's going to be the real deal. I think Marco Linez, it's, it's a harder position to predict at Iowa, but – I've been very high on him. And if he doesn't work out at Iowa, I'm going to probably take some flack because I've been on the Marco Linez train for quite some time. Uh, in 2024, I'm pumped about Brevin Dahl. And I, I mean, I know the stigmas out there. Like, he's a white running back from Iowa. But there's something about how he plays, Mark. There is something about how he plays. And, again, I don't even know what he's ranked. I, I'm assuming he's a three-star. I don't know where he ranks nationally or – really even in the state of Iowa, but there's something about him. And, you know, maybe that's just intuition. Maybe that's gut feeling that it'll eventually deceive you. But that's how I look at classes. It does feel like 2023, once they lost Caden Proctor, 2023 became a class of raw talent. And whether you're talking about Grant Leaper or Dayton Howard, guys who are physically gifted, had almost no other high major offers and interest and I was taking a chance on them, especially with a guy like Dayton Howard, who's a wide receiver. But given their physical upside, you could see that paying off, or you could see it not, because that's happened before as well. So I don't know. I, f- I feel like each class kind of has storylines, and once Proctor decommitted, it kind of changed the dynamics of the 23 class. Dahl is the 28th rated running back in the nation, which is okay. one spot higher than a Michigan uh, recruit. And yeah. a Clemson in the thirtieth spot. Yeah, and, and like I said, he's he's. I know this is it's, it's just a stigma, but he's a white dude from Des Moines. I mean, <laughs> I'm telling you, the way he runs, the way he runs, is different. It may not work out, but he's a guy to watch for. Yeah, if he was playing linebacker or offensive tackle, then that would be fine. No one would raise an eyebrow. <laughs> 